Okay, well, let's get started. Um, welcome to the Topos Institute Colloquium. Today, we're very happy to have Simon Willerton telling us about metric spaces, entropic spaces, and convexity. Please, Simon. Great, thank you. Um, I think I've I hope my setup is working. Um, so, uh, yeah, pleasure to be invited. Um, unfortunately, uh, yeah, usually on a Thursday evening, there's a for for me, there's a there's a clash. So I'm not able to make as many of these as I would like. So, but, but um, yeah, so lovely to be invited to give a talk here. Um, so, what I wanted to talk about today um, is um, I, I put the Weasley words in there uh, of work in progress. So I haven't. Quite written everything up yet and there's, there's certainly some bits where um some some interesting stuff to do but uh let's just sort of dive in whoops uh oops, make sure i'm on the right screen good okay so just a quick introduction of, of of what the uh sort of background to this is so um so i guess there's three kind of input so so um i would been thinking a lot about enriched categories and, and metric spaces over the years and I was sort of aware of work of um, Levere's on uh, ther thermodynamics. Now don't worry if you know nothing about thermodynamics, I know very little about thermodynamics as well, but he has this paper in which he, uh, he sort of argues that state spaces for thermodynamics should be certain kind of metric like uh, spaces, so uh, sort of certain kind of enriched categories um, which he calls entropic spaces. So I'll, I'll say a bit more about those uh, in a bit. Um, and then about 18 months ago, something like that. So John Byers, Owen Lynch, Joe Muller um, have a paper on thermodynamics and this sort of category theoretic approach um, where they say that state spaces and notion of entropy should be respectively kind of convex spaces. So the state spaces should be convex spaces and the notion of entropy is some idea of a concave map to this extended uh, real numbers. Um, and th this sort of stood out to me, I mean, particularly the sort of minus infinity plus infinity, that's sort of very much related to this uh, Levere um, sort of perspective. But th I mean, on the face of it, there's no real connection between these, but it looked to me as though there should definitely be a connection um, and so my goal was really to synthes synthesize these two approaches uh, to get a kind of category of convex entropic spaces and concave maps. So make it so that these, these two approaches kind of live in the same world. And the inspiration for this was the work of um, Tobias Fritz and Paolo Peroni. I don't know if Tobias is here, Paolo's certainly here. Um, so they have an approach to um, the convexity monad on metric spaces. So I'll, I'll say a bit more about that. So I think this was, was Paolo's thesis, uh, where they do a lot of work on uh, this convexity monad. And um, so I was familiar with that, and that definitely struck me as being, um, uh, as being very much um, amenable to an interpretation in terms of enriched category theory. Uh, I should mention a sort of similar work in a paper of Madari, Panangarden, and Plotkin, um, but I'm far less familiar that, with that because that's very much a sort of computer sciencey sort of paper. And I, yeah, so I, I'm not familiar with the language, so I sort of struggle a lot more. But I think similar things um, in there as well. But but um, what I'm going to do today, so this is sort of the goal, is to sort of synthesize these two approaches and get uh, a new sort of uh, enriched category theory approach to uh, to get this um, actually a two category of, of convex entropic spaces and concave maps, uh, but heavily inspired by by the work of uh, Tobias and Paolo. Um, and in fact, a lot of what I'm I'm going to be doing today is is sort of putting uh, their work in a sort of enriched theory, uh, enriched category theoretic kind of context, really. Um, so what else did I want to say for the introduction? So I think that, that, that's it basically. So, so that's the goal and um, sort of using Paolo and Tobias's work as, as very much a, a guide to getting there. Okay, so um, let's just dive in and talk a little bit about convexity monads. So, um, so convexity monads, um, so this is 
kind of thing that's been rediscovered uh, sort of many times and goes under under sort of many names. Um, but there's a monad on the category of sets, um, which I will call C, um, which is defined as follows. Uh, so if you've got a space X, then the idea is that you look at all of the formal convex linear combinations of points. OK, so you look at uh, so I, I, I denote sort of a formal element of, uh, of, a, of a sum just using this sort of ceiling sign. So that just means I'm, I'm thinking about the, it is a formal symbol, really. So the idea is that so here here's an example let's just look at this example first so i've got some some set x um and i'm just going to take uh, some convex linear combination of points here so i've got a point here with uh, with coefficient a quarter a point with a coefficient a quarter and a point with coefficient a half so i've just got some formal sum where the coefficients uh, live between zero and one they're real numbers and they sum to one um, and it's just a finite number of them. So this goes by many names. Um, so this is the convexity monad or the distribution monad or the finitely supported measures monad. So it crops up in, in various ways. So this becomes a monad because if I, if I have a, you know, for, for monad multiplication, if I have a formal linear combination of a formal li linear combination, I want to come up with a formal linear combination. Well, if I have like uh, this formal lump linear combination of points and another formal linear combination of points, then I could say I have a third of this and two thirds of my other combination. And then I just combine them by just multiplying the uh, coefficients, say these by a third and the coefficients in the other in the other combination by two thirds. And I'll get a new uh, formal linear combination. So. Um, and that gives rise to a monad and th this is uh, one reason this is of interest is because um, of its algebras and um, and by definition these are going to be uh, convex spaces so convex spaces are going to be algebras for this monad so um, so an algebra is as usual is going to consist of a set and some function from the uh, from the monad evaluated on that set, i.e. The, the formal linear combinations just to that x. So the idea is that if I have some formal linear, some convex formal linear combination, so coefficients add to one, um, then from that I want to produce an element in my in my set. And the idea is that th that's like these are like barycentric coordinates. So if I have some number of points and some weighting on each of these points, then in uh, then I get a new element inside the set, uh, which is sort of lying between all these points with 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 weighting. So uh, so a classic example would just be take Euclidean space um, and you just take the the obvious way of taking a linear combination of of points in Euclidean space and that will give you a, a convex space. And that's agrees with a sort of usual notion of convexity. So um, uh, but but this is this is sort of more general uh, than than just thinking about um, Euclidean spaces. So that's what the algebras for the monad are, and then we get the notion of an algebra map. So if we have two convex spaces, so an algebra map is just going to be um, a, a function between the underlying sets. I get out get out the way of my slides there, um, and so. Uh, and we're just going to get that the um, taking the function sort of commutes with taking formal linear uh, taking linear combinations in this way. So um, so f of this linear combination of points is equal to the linear combination of f of the points. So here I just note that um, if I don't have those um, those kind of ceiling symbols, then, then that means I've got an algebra and I'm just taking this linear combination in inside the, um, the convex space. So, yeah, so if my spaces were just Euclidean spaces with the usual convex structure on them, the usual linear structure, then such a such an algebra map uh, would just be an affine 
uh, map of the underlying vector spaces. And so these are called convex linear maps. OK, um, so do do shout in if there's any any clarifications needed. OK, um, so now there's one. Um, one particular special case of that, which is so-called uh, the rational convexity monad. So we can consider just things where we have a, a rational linear combination. So our coefficients are, we're only allowed rational numbers between zero and one in this case. Okay, so, um, and these have this following special property where uh, we can just, if we have such a rational linear combination, when, then we can just write them as sort of an average of uh, some set of points, if you like. So just giving you an example, so we've got some formal linear combination of points, we can just take the lowest common denominator of the coefficients and pull that out, so it, that's like a quarter of this uh, set of points here. Sorry, Simon. Um... Yeah. It sounds like here you're allowed to repeat the two different XIs. Yeah. But in the previous one, uh, if I understood right, well, maybe it's the same monad, but but it didn't seem like you were allowed to because that would have there would be a larger set of those than just distributions. You would you would know kind of your natural number n also. Uh, um right, okay. So I guess yeah, okay. So I guess with the definition I've given here, the yeah, there should be an equivalent. So, so really, what? A, yeah, okay, that's a good point. Yeah. So, so, so the right way to define this is just as finitely supported functions on the set. So the n, right. yeah, yeah. Right. So, so if I had uh, a half times x one and a half times x one as two, uh, as I had the point repeated, then that's the same as just adding the. Coefficient. Okay. Okay. But in so, the so I should have defined it. Yeah, as finitely supported functions. Yeah. Right, but in the next one, because you did it with the one over n, you're kind of allowing things to repeat and yeah. not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, that was sort of the informal. I, sh I should have put an equivalence relation. Yeah, the right way to say it is, is finitely supported functions. Yeah. And uh, if I have so finitely supported functions, then then this, as as you've just said, this way of expressing it is is non unique. Um, because I, I, there are two ways to write it in this way. So the n is not necessarily well defined in this expression. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So what we have is sort of uh, if we just restrict ourselves to this uh, rational version, then um, this is just like um, really an average of a, an unordered, multi, uh, unordered list of points or a multi set of points. Um, and this has a much more kind of discrete or combinatorial feel to it. Um, now it, it looks, um, you might think by looking at this, well, uh, if you're familiar with these things, that this just looks like maybe the, the free symmetric monad on the set, uh, because then you just take uh, a sort of an unordered list of points, but the, multi the monad multiplication is different. So it's, it, it might look like that's what it is, but it's, it's different. Okay. Okay. So, so that's sort of you, 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 the situation for um, sets, um, but we're interested in doing this for uh, sort of um, metric spaces, which we're going to be thinking of enriched as enriched categories. So, um, when we're thinking about metric spaces as enriched categories, so we think about enriching over commutative quantiles. So another name for commutative quantiles is sort of co-complete skeletal closed symmetric monoidal thin categories. So these are um, enriching over posets or monoidal posets is another way of saying this. So, um, so a good example here and the one we're going to concentrate on but not ultimately the one that I'm interested in but uh, just for ease today I'm going to concentrate on this. Um, is the um, a quantile of non extended non negative real numbers. Um, so I'm thinking of this as a, um, a poset or a category um, with at most one morphism between objects. And um, so I've got a morphism from A to B if A is bigger than or equal to B. 
and the monoidal structure here is going to be addition of real numbers. So the uh, the unit uh, for the monoidal structure is just zero. So that's um, that's a good thing to enrich in, as we'll see in a minute. But the uh, we've got other things that we could enrich in. We can um, say other things of interest are these ones here. So we could um, enrich in this um, poset of extended real numbers where we take all the real numbers and we add uh, plus or minus infinity. If you remember, that's the kind of thing we saw um, that um, Joe and, and John and Owen were interested in. Um, and well, actually it wasn't necessarily this one. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so we can put two possible orders on that, either greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. And we, we turns out we get slightly uh, different things that are of interest. Um, so we can just take the extended real numbers with greater than or equal to and addition as the monoidal structure or we could have taken less than or equal to with addition as, as the monoidal structure. Now there's a subtle difference here because um, addition just means addition on finite numbers. Now on these two structures, addition is actually different when you get to um, adding infinite things together. So in our, in this one, um, I mean, it's sort of, sort of a, a side comment really, but when we add minus infinity and plus infinity, um, it makes sense to take the addition to be, uh, uh, which way around it is on this one, plus infinity for this one. And when we reverse the inequality, we want the addition of minus infinity and plus infinity to be minus infinity. So there's some, some subtleties as to what addition is on the, uh, on the infinite things in these cases, but um, I won't go into those too much today. Um, but if you were at my... Um, my applied category theory at UCR seminar back in the uh, early days of the pandemic, I talked about the Legendre transform and um, in the enriched category setting, and that's very much using uh, using this as the enriching category. And when you're doing convex analysis, it makes sense uh, when you're doing that in the enriched setting to to work with this one. And if you're doing uh, well. If you're Levere and you're thinking about thermodynamics, then he was very much thinking about enriching over the extended real numbers with the opposite um, order on. Um, so, so those are sort of two other quantiles we could be interested in, as well as the sort of usual metric space one. Uh, and there's also the standard kind of truth values uh, where, the, where we're just taking truth values, so uh, just the category with true and false uh, as the objects, and we've got entailment as the, um, as the morphism. So false entails true, but there's no entailment from true to false. Uh, and we take logical and as the, um, as the monoidal structure and true is then the, the monoidal unit. Um, so when we enrich over that, we get the theory of pre-orders. Um, so just usual pre-orders. So let's just, um, Let's just look at enriching over um, the non-negative real numbers. So when we're taking categories enriched over non-negative reals, um, so between each pair of objects, the idea is we're supposed to take something in the enriching category, that's supposed to be our home object, and this is gonna be an extended non-negative number. Um, and the composition, um, for home objects becomes the triangle inequality and the fact that we have um, something, uh, some version of um, identity uh, means that uh, the, the number associated from, uh, from an object to itself is less than or equal to zero. Uh, so, uh, but we know that it's already greater than or equal to zero. So that's saying that the, uh, the object associated to uh, the, the home object from an object to itself is actually equal to zero. So, so let me just say that again. So, so, so if we're enriching in R plus bar, a category has a, 
set of objects associated to each pair of objects, we've got a number which we're thinking of as distance. Uh, the composition of uh, for enriched categories becomes the triangle inequality, and the notion of having an identity means that the self distance is zero. So something slightly weirder happens uh, in these other cases is that self distance can be minus infinity as well as zero. Um, but yeah, so we get these sort of slightly strange uh, points in our sort of metric spaces, which can have this sort of infinite self distance, but uh, we'll not worry about that today. Okay, so, so um, I'm going to use this idea of an R plus bar category, a category enriched in R plus bar as, as what I mean by metric space. Uh, so it's, if I say metric space, I mean one of these things. Uh, which isn't the same as a classical space because uh, metric space because we don't necessarily have symmetry between distances and we are allowing infinite values for our distances. So it's, it's like a classical metric space, um, but it can be non-symmetric uh, in a distance and we're allowing infinite distances. Okay, but, but yeah, just a warning that when I say metric space, I mean this sort of generalized metric space or, or R plus bar category. Okay, so we get a we get a category of these en enriched um, categories. So uh, these R plus n uh, R plus bar enriched categories form a category called R plus bar cat. Uh, so these are just these generalized metric spaces where the, the objects are generalized metric spaces and the morphisms are going to be the R plus bar functors, which in this case are just short maps which means distance non-increasing map. So uh, functions between metric spaces which don't increase the distance. So, so let's just have a look at some examples then. So um, first example then is R plus bar itself we want to consider as an R plus bar category. So we've got some notion of distance on it. And so we're we take that, uh, so maybe if I just draw a picture here, that, that probably helps. So the idea is that, uh, so I want this to be R plus bar, and we've got sort of zero, and we're going up to uh, infinity at the top there. And, uh, and I'm sort of drawing it vertically for a reason. And if I've got a a number A and a number B. So the idea is that um, it costs me to go up, but it's free to go down. So the distance from A to B is going to be uh, B minus A. But if I come downwards from B to A, the idea is that that has zero distance. So there's no distance coming down uh, that away. Okay. Um, so we write that. Um, in the following way. So we write that as this sort of truncated subtraction. So the distance in R plus bar from A to B is this truncated subtraction. So B minus dot A, which is either B minus A, if that's bigger than zero, otherwise it's zero. Okay. Um, and the next example, we sort of see uh, how this is sort of, how, how this perspective of having asymmetric distances is actually interesting even when you're considering uh, classical metric spaces. So, so M is going to be any metric space. In particular, it can be a classical metric space. So we, we, you can pick your favorite uh, metric space, uh, which might have symmetric distances. And I'm going to look at the, the set of all compact subsets of, uh, of this space M. Um, and then I'm going to put this, um, this metric on, which is definitely going to be asymmetric, um, where the distance from a set, uh, a subset A to a subset B is given in the following way. So, so here we've got, got our, our subset, uh, sorry, here we've got our, our set uh, M, our metric space M, and we've got a subset A and a subset B, um, and uh, the idea is that uh, the distance from A to B is kind of um, how far 
I have to go from A to get to B. So, so what I do is that each point in, in capital A, I look what's the nearest point in B, um, and I do that over all points in A. So I take the, the, the point in A which is furthest away from B, and I take that to be my distance. So if there's a fire and I want to get into B as quickly as possible, what's the furthest I have to go? Okay, and so that's just the supremum over all points in A or the infimum over all points of B of the distance in M from A to B. Um, but that's definitely uh, not, uh, yeah, that's definitely not gonna be symmetric because in particular, if, um, as it says here, um, if A is a subset of B, then you don't have to go any distance to get to B. Um, so the distance from A, capital A to capital B in that case is going to be zero, but, um, but it probably will be some distance from, from B to A. So, um, so we, we get that the distance can be zero in some cases, but that's very much encoding this sort of order relation on, on sets. But this is very natural thing to consider, even for classical spaces where you have a symmetric distance. Uh, there's this sort of, this nice example, um, which is a sort of generalization or an asymmetrization of the so-called Hausdorff metric on compact subsets. Um, so I think Owen was asking something about uh, why not all subsets? Um, well, that's just to make this statement correct. There's probably other reasons. I mean, I could have said closed subsets, um, but if you don't, uh, for instance, impose closure, then the distance is going to be zero if I think it's the closure of A is contained in B or something like that. So, so you can you can look at um, sort of more general things than just compact subsets, but you don't such a, get such a clean statement there. Okay, so another example of such a sort of this generalized metric space or arbalus bar category. So if we have Y and Z are themselves generalized metric spaces, then um, we can consider the, the set of short maps from Y to Z. Um, and we can say the idea is that enrich, the theory of enriched categories will tell us that this itself is a, an enriched category. So the, um, the short maps from Y to Z, uh, we can put the following kind of metric on them. So if we've got Y and Z here, and we've got two maps between them, we've got F is the green one and, and Y is the purple one, then the distance between F and G is just the, uh, we look at all the points in Y and look how far you have to go from f of f of y to g of y and the worst that you have to travel that's the distance between them okay and that um, that's the sort of natural thing that's the thing that the enriched category theory tells us to to look at um, and this if you you know in courses on analysis where you look at functions on the on the interval this sort of generalizes uh, that sort of distance there Okay, so um, so we were interested in convex metric spaces. So uh, that's sort of my goal. And I've sort of said a little bit about metric spaces and I've said a bit about convex spaces. So I want to kind of combine them. Um, so th the idea is that I want a convex metric space to be an algebra for an appropriate convexity monad on these generalized metric spaces. So the idea is that um, I'm going to define this by taking the underlying set uh, to the formal uh, convex linear combinations again, um, that's gonna be what it is on the underlying set, but I need to put a metric on this. So that, that would just give me something from metric spaces to sets, but I'm gonna put a metric on here. And it turns out there's, there's not just one way to do that, but um, the first way I'm gonna do that is the one that's sort of coming from uh, the, the category theory, essentially. Um, so I've got two, uh, two formal convex linear combinations of points here, um, and I want to have some notion of distance between them. Now I can consider my formal convex linear combination, um, as I mentioned earlier, I can think of it as a finite measure. So, so I said the one way to think about this is just a finitely supported function on, uh, on my set. 
Um, and that gives rise to a function on function. So you can think of it as a finite measure where I've got a quarter, a quarter and a half is the sort of mass at these points. And so I could, if I've given a function on the space X taking value in the reals, or in fact, the extended uh, non-negative reals, I should say, uh, then I can just essentially integrate against that measure. So in other words, let's just have a look at this. So, so I've got some uh, formal linear combination of points and I've got a function. So I want, I want that to be a short map to the real uh, non-negative real. So I want to think of that as being a short map from, from X to R plus bar. Um, but I can just essentially, yeah, integrate with respect to that finite measure, or another way of saying that is evaluate it at each of those points and just wet, add them together using the weighting coming from the convex combination. So given a formal linear combination, what I get is a function on functions. And in fact, this, this, this assignation assigning um, uh, this number to a function is in fact a short map. So this thing here, given, given any fixed linear combination, we get a short map from, um, from short maps to the real numbers. Okay. So uh, what we get is from this set here, we get a map of sets from the set of formal linear combinations into this metric space. So, so we can in fact just pull back the metric. Um, so I've told you, uh, that this naturally has a metric. So I've said that R plus bar has a metric on it. And I've said, if you've got two metric spaces, then the functions between them, the short maps between them have a metric on them. So that's what I said at the example three and example one, tells you how to define the metric on here. And so when you do it, just move out the way there. So when, when you do that, uh, this is the metric you get. So between, uh, this formal linear combination of points, um, alpha i x i, and this formal linear combination beta j x prime j, you just take the supremum over all short uh, maps from x to r plus bar, and you just take this uh, sort of truncated difference uh, of the evaluation of the functions. So that's just popping out of the of the category theorem. And in fact, that uh, uh, that gives us a monad. In fact, this is a sort of a sub monad. Uh, this sort of double dualization thing here where you take the functions on the functions, uh, that is actually a monad, but this gives rise uh, to a monad, which is just generalizing the sort of classical convexity monad. Okay, so that's just dropping out of the category theory there. Um, now, many of you here, I think, know that there's another way to define a metric, and that's sort of thinking in terms of optimal transport. So um, now if I have some formal linear combination of points in a set, I can think of that um, as a distribution of goods. So the idea is that um, I've got some goods, maybe I, I think of it as sand, I've got a ton of sand, and I, I'm going to put a quarter of a ton at this point, quarter of a ton at that point, and a half a ton at the other point. So I'm thinking of this as a distribution of, of mass. And now um, the I can assign a distance between two distributions in this way using um, the ideas of optimal transport. So, so if I've got two such formal linear combinations, I'm going to think of ways of transporting one distribution of mass to another distribution of mass. So a transport plan is going to tell me how much sand to take from each point in the first linear combination to each point in the second linear combination. So, so I'm going to have um, Aij, so for each i for the, for the uh, source and each j for the target, is going to tell me how, many, how much goods I'm going to take from xi to xj primed. And so for each point here, I'm going to have an amount going to the first point, an amount going to the second point, and so on. And I want that the total amount uh, coming out of this point has to be the amount that was originally there. So I'm going to share up the sand that was at this first point, first point into all these other points, but I want that to, um, the total amount coming out to be the amount that was there originally. So that's uh, this condition on the AIJ. So, so for each, each I, so for the first point, I want that the sum 
over all of the points uh, in the sort of the, the source combination uh, just to be the amount of stuff that was there to start with. OK, so this is sort of a conversation, con this conservation of mass sort of thing. And similarly, for each point in the in the sort of the target combination, I need that they uh, in my uh, the AIJs have to sum to the amount that's there. So I want the total amount coming into this point to be a third. So a transport plan is just some AI, uh, some matrix of AIJs. So telling me how much stuff to move from each point to each point, subject to this these constraints uh, that you've got to have the right amount coming out and the right amount going in. Now, if I've got a transport plan in this way, then I'm going to have an associated cost. So remember, X here was a metric space and the distance uh, between points is telling you how much it costs to move one unit of goods from one place to the next. So if I've got a transport plan, then AIJ times the distance from XI to XJ primed is telling you the cost of transporting AIJ's worth of goods from the i point in the source to the j point in the target. And so if I sum all those together, that's giving me the cost of my transport plan. So, um, so what I want to do is that I want to minimize the cost of transporting the goods. So I'm just going to take the infimum over all, um, all transport plans, all A AIJs, where I AIJs lives between zero and one is and is subject to these, um, these constraints. And that gives us sort of the minimal cost of transporting uh, from this distribution of masses to this distribution of masses. And that also gives us a, a, a sort of generalized metric here. Um, and uh, this then gives rise to a monad um, on the generalized metric space. So, so this is sometimes called the um, the Wasserstein or Kantorovich Rubinstein metric, or at least in the in the case of classical metric spaces, I should say. Now, um, now there's a sort of well known uh, sort of classical result, which says that um, I've, I've given you these two um, these two metrics on the um, space of formal convex linear combinations. One which was in terms of this supremum over short maps and this other one, which was in terms of um, minimum uh, sort of transport cost. Um, and Kantorovich duality says that if X is a classical metric space, uh, then these two things are actually equal. Uh, so that's sort of quite a, a celebrated uh, result. Um, now, when it, we don't want to be in this classical world. Uh, we want to uh, have this uh, in the case that X is uh, one of these generalized metric spaces where we can allow non-symmetric distances. Now, it turns out you, if um, X has all finite distances, um, so we don't have any infinite distances, then uh, these two agree. So, uh, so this is just a uh, sort of linear programming, essentially. So you can just write uh, these. Well, where you can prove that is you can sort of write this uh, down as a linear programming problem. You're tr trying to find some supremum, some optimal thing. Uh, you write that down as a linear programming problem. You apply linear programming duality um, and then uh, you sort of rearrange your answer using the fact that, that this is a uh, a distance satisfies triangle inequality, etc., and uh, and you can rephrase it in terms of this this other uh, problem of finding this infimum here. Okay. Um, on the other hand, um, if you have uh, that these are sort of symmetric distances, but you allow infinite distances, then my ex student Callum Reader has a has a result, I believe, um, that. Uh, these two distances are the same as well. And I think, um, you know, one just wants to take the push out of this diagram and says this is sort of likely in general. Um, and I, yeah, so I haven't actually um, managed to combine them because because they're a bit gnarly. So neither of these are sort of a kind of nice um, in, a, in a certain sense. So they both require a bit of 
uh, tweaking things. So um, I still haven't quite proved that, uh, that um, it's true in the, in the general case, um, but I, I think that's probably very likely. Okay, so we wanted to uh, talk about algebras. We wanted convex spaces. So um, we wanted algebras for these and, um, Oh, it sounded like just something had just fallen. Um, so by definition, a convex metric space is going to be an algebra for, well, e either of these monads, well, depending, um, it might be, uh, one might be nicer in a particular situation, but um, certainly if we've only got finite distances, then they're the same. So um, we're going to have an algebra for these monads is going to mean in particular that we've got a metric space and the underlying set is a convex space, uh, so uh, an algebra for the usual convexity monad, and there's going to be some compatibility between them. Um, so it's bizarrely uh, sort of difficult to um, write down this compatibility as far as I can tell. So, um, so certainly uh, this is something that as uh, Tobias and Paolo have done in the case um, where um, we've got rational coefficients. So if we're just looking at um, convex combinations where we look at rational coefficients, then remember I said this monad has this more combinatorial feel and you can use the fact that, I mean, essentially you're looking at an integer linear programming problem then and it turns out that these are particularly nice and you can do some nice things in that case, um, which allows you to write down what the compatibility between metric space, uh, the metric space structure and the convex structure is, um, which is just given by some expression of, um, doesn't matter exactly what it is, but we can write it down in that case. And then I, I think um, uh, Paolo and Tobias uh, then use that to, um, to characterize the convexity um, for complete metric spaces. Um, so just using the fact that you can do it if the coefficients are rational by using some completeness property, you can do it in general. Uh, but it's sort of slightly strange that it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to do that um, without passing through the rational case. Okay, so, so we've now um, got some notion of convex metric space, these generalized convex metric spaces. Um, as algebras for this monad, but we can do more. Um, so, um, so every enriched category has an underlying category. That's a sort of general fact about enriched categories. And when we're doing quantiles, when we're enriching in quantiles, I mean, it turns out that that underlying category um, is a preorder. So, if we've got a sort of generalized metric space, then there's a there's a there's a sort of pre-order underlying that, which is defined in the following way. So we've got some generalized metric space X, then we can say that a point A in the space is bigger than or equal to a point B if the distance from A to B is zero. It turns out that's the, the natural thing to consider. That That is what comes from thinking about the underlying category. So for instance, in the uh, case of um, R plus bar, this recovers the usual um, order on um, on the real numbers. So um, A is bigger than or equal to B. Uh, so that's the opposite here. So um, A is bigger than or equal to B here. That was bigger than, no, I've drawn it with the opposite A and Bs here. If B, the distance from B to A is zero. So B is bigger than or equal to A if and only if the distance from B to A is zero in this picture. Uh, but writing it in this way, yeah, so I've just written it the other way around here. A is bigger than or equal to B if the distance from A to B is zero. So we just recover the usual order on the extended reals there. Now, if we look at our, our the situation with the uh, compact subspaces, uh, subsets of a, of a metric space, now um, we get some induced order on the compact subsets. Um, but we observed that explicitly the distance from A to B is zero precisely when A is a subset of B. So again, this underlying category idea from the metric we had just recovers the standard order on subsets.
Uh, Simon, you asked for a five minute warning. So it's, in five minutes, you'll hit your, you'll start cutting into question time. Great. Okay, thanks. So, so I've, I've got this slide and two more slides after this. So yeah, thanks. Um, right. Okay. So, um, so then if we looked at the, um, the maps, uh, sort of the metric space of short maps, if we've got two metric spaces, Y and Z, uh, then we've got an induced order on the, um, on the short maps from Y to Z. And that's just, uh, if F's a short map from Y to Z and G is F is bigger than or equal to G if, um, it's bigger than or equal to point Y. So for every Y in Y, the, the image under F is bigger than an image under G with the induced ordering on Z coming from this. Um, and in the, you know, you don't get nothing for nothing or you don't get anything for nothing. So if we, if X was originally either a discrete space, uh, a discrete set, so with uh, sort of zero distance from a point to itself or infinite distance, the different points, um, or X is the classical symmetric space, then you don't get anything uh, interesting. So the, the, the order you get is just the identity uh, order, uh, ordering or the equality ordering. Okay. Um, now, the convexity monad we had was, was just on the, the category of R plus bar categories, the category of metric spaces, the category of metric spaces. Um, but it turns out that this, this sort of easily gets souped up um, because, again, in enriched categories, VCAT um, is often a uh, closed monoidal. So it's the case here. So we can think of this um, metric spaces is actually enriched in metric spaces. So, but we've already seen that because the HOM object between two metric spaces, well, that's the short maps. And I've, I've told you that we can, we've got a metric on the, the short maps between uh, two spaces. So, so in fact, um, R plus bar cat underline. So this means the enriched category of um, enriched categories. Um, and this double dualization monad, this, this just, um, convexity monad, this extends easily to that, or uh, that's just a, a calculation showing that something's a short map. So, so it actually uh, is sort of pumped up in that way. And, and then we can just actually look at the underlying uh, categories here. Um, and we go from that, the enriched categories here, we can just think of them as two categories. So, if you're sort of confused by the levels going on here, just a reminder. So R plus bar capital letters cap means the two category metric spaces, short maps, and then the two morphisms are just the ordering between the short maps. So, so these are generalized metric spaces here. Um, and so, so we just, our convexity thing just gives us a two monad um, between these two categories. And because we've got a two monad, that means we've got a little bit more to play with. So we don't necessarily just have algebras and algebra maps. We've got algebras, uh, we can have uh, sort of lax algebras, we can have lax algebra maps, etc. Uh, sort of a standard thing is uh, that, that what is interesting is the sort of the strict algebras and the lax maps. And what happens in this case, so we've already seen what the strict algebras are. These are these convex metric spaces. So metric spaces equipped with some um, some uh, some notion of algebra for the convexity monad, um, but the lax algebra maps here. So um, we don't get that sort of squares commute exactly, but they they commute up to um, uh, up to two morphisms, um, uh, which are just the inequalities here. So. So what that comes down to is that there's a comparison. Um, so, so that when you take the linear combination of F applied to all the points, that's got to be bigger than or equal to um, F applied uh, to the linear combination of, of those points. Now, if you write that down, what that means. So if the target here, um, if Y is just the real numbers, and X is just a, a, a metric space in the usual sense, then this is just the standard notion of what it means for a, for a map to be convex. Um, 
So yeah, so if X were just a, a, a vector space, then, then this is the, the notion of, of a convex map um, rather than being a, an affine map. Okay, and that's good because, uh, well, I guess I, I've said lax and convex here, and I could say colax, and then the inequality gets rever reversed, and, and then we get uh, concave maps. So this is all uh, sort of nice stuff, and the, the idea is that, you know, I've been talking about sort of um, this sort of generalization of metric spaces where I allow asymmetry, but I, I, but I can do this for any, uh, Quantile, where I have a notion of convexity for it. So if I can take convex combinations of elements in the quantile, then I can do all of the stuff that I've been doing. So um, I can just do the enriched category theory for the convex quantile um, and have this notion of a convexity monad and the, the sort of the, the, uh, the two category of these sort of lax algebras for the, for the strict, uh, the lax algebra maps for the uh, strict algebra. So, um, so these three examples I gave before, these are all convex quantiles. We can give uh, convex structures to all of these. So with R and uh, R bar and R bar opposite, um, they're essentially the obvious convex structures you would put on the real numbers. So the obvious way to take convex linear combinations of real numbers, but you just have to worry about what's going on at infinity. Um, as ever. And so then what we do, you know, we can just turn the handle and we obtain a two monad from, from these um, R bar opposite uh, categories. And these are precisely um, sort of these met generalized metric spaces where we allow um, negative distances with, with disordering on them. These are precisely um, Levia's entropic spaces. So we get a two monad on entropic spaces and we can then take the two categories of strict algebras and lax morphisms together with this ordering of them at the two level space, uh, the two morphism level. And we just drops out this idea of the two category of convex entropic spaces and concave maps with the ordering on. And that's exactly the thing that I wanted to do. So if I now just whiz back right to the beginning um, and then that's the that's exactly the position I wanted to get to to kind of synthesize these two uh, sort of situation these two positions one uh, from Levia and one from from John Owen and Joe um, where we've got exactly the entropic spaces and you see here the concave maps to minus infinity plus infinity these are these are just so that's our enriching category we're looking at concave maps to the enriching category. So what we've got here are the, the algebras for the monad and the, the lax morphisms, which are pre, so it's pre sheaves, which are the lax morphisms. So yeah, so uh, that's basically where I wanted to get to, to show you that, you know, uh, these, these approaches can be synthesized by using uh, this sort of the uh, Fritz Peroni approach, as long as we're thinking about it in the right enriched category theory way. Cool. Thanks, Simon. I'm the only one who unmuted, but there are lots of claps in the chat. Um, so uh, are there questions? If anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand or just um, unmute and ask. I guess I'll start out with a question. Um, so if you talked about lax uh, morphisms between these strict algebras. And when you did those lax morphisms, um, you sort of forgot, you, when you went from the enriched to the, 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 the category enriched in RR plus cat to just a normal two category, you, you forgot that you actually have like metrics between your 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 morphisms um and i'm wonder i'm wondering if can, if have you thought about lax algebra maps where um like like that inequality means that the distance is zero have you thought about like lax maps where the distance is less than epsilon so then you have like a 
a notion of lax map for every epsilon. Uh, the, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> okay. that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah. Um, I, I think I must have thought vaguely about something about what's happening with the enriched monad and algebras, but I can't think why I didn't go. Maybe I just sort of was thinking about the, the, uh, the two monad rather than the enriched monad and, and didn't go back to that. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I would call this like approximately lax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I have a question oh. about the entropic oh. spaces. Uh, in sub in the uh, subject of thermodynamics, you know, what are the objects of uh, an entropic metric space? Uh, you know, what are what is the uh, monad operation, and what is the metric? Okay, so so. Um... If I can get this, uh, yeah, so I should have um, got the Viz paper out before. Um, uh, yeah, just to refresh myself. But but the idea is, so, so you've got some thermodynamic system and the state space, so you've got states. And the idea is that there's sort of some notion of entropy supply between states of your system. And um, um, and that that difference in entropy is supposed to be like the distance, but this can be negative as well. Um, and the idea is that um, if you figure out what happens if you you have three uh, states and look at what the change in entropy is, and you, you look at what happens with the triangle, uh, sort of a version of the triangle inequality, then that's reversed to, to what it normally is. So So yeah, so an entropic space just means a space with a notion of inverted commas distance, which can be negative or positive and or plus or minus infinity. And the triangle inequality is the opposite way around to how you think about it uh, normally. Um, and yeah, so Levere has this interpretation uh, that sort of difference, uh, sort of entropy supply between uh, states in your system should, should behave like this. Okay, and then in the monad, what is the plus operation? Uh, so, so, sorry, say that again. In the monad, what is the the plus or the monad? Oh, oh, oh so, the, so, so the monad. So, so the idea is that as you associate to your entropic space. You just the monad just associates formal linear combinations, uh, formal convex linear uh, combinations of things in. Uh, and your original space, uh, but the idea is that you have this uh, entropic distance. So you, the distance you would write down using uh, either of those formulas I gave for, for a distance, that would give you something which could be negative or, or minus infinity. Okay, thanks. But, but the important thing is the algebras for that give you some notion of what a, a convex entropic space is. Yeah. Great. I think we have time for one more question from Paolo. Yeah, thank you. No, it's not really a question. I just wanted to point out uh, about Owen's comment that one could take some form of metric version of uh, lax morphisms where you, you make the diagonal commute only up to epsilon. There's a little problem there that that way they're not going to be closed under composition because if you compose two of them, these two cells are going to be in general giving you a distance of two epsilon. However, one can solve the problem by using weighted categories where one associate where, where epsilon is the weight and so that way one can still make a category i don't know if that helps anyone cool i hadn't heard of weighted categories uh i want to check that out that's awesome so, uh, so so you should look in paolo's uh paper on <laughs> uh, actually, a good yes. actually you should look at the paper that i cite in my paper because that yep. Yeah, so that's, well, a, that's yeah. a nice introduction by, yeah, by yeah. I think, Grandis. Yeah, well, you should look in Paolo's paper for the references, I guess, is what I should have said, yes. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, thanks to you again, Simon, and thanks to everyone for coming. Uh,